If you've never read the full entire book of Nehemiah, I, I extremely um, challenge you to please uh, dive into this amazing prophetic book that the Lord and the Holy Spirit gave to Nehemiah so many thousands of years ago. The book of Nehemiah was written around the time of uh, the post-exilic time of Israel after they had been in captivity of, with Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, it was written around the time frame of B.C. 446. Uh, that, is a round, that is a roundabout date. We know that uh, the chronological order of things in the Old Testament, Esther became first, and then Ezra, and then Nehemiah. If you remember the story of Esther, she, she was a Jew, and at the time they had been captured by uh, King Artaxerxes, and Haman wanted to put the Jews to death. Um, but it was for such a time as that, that Esther, Hadassah, it was her Jewish name, should rise up and challenge the king and the people at the time to not uh, kill the Jews because Haman, Haman wanted to kill the Jews. Uh, and there's a lot of study that can be done about Haman and how that whole story came about and how we got to Ezra and then how we're in Nehemiah now. But a little bit of background about Nehemiah. The, the name Nehemiah means the Lord comforts. Uh, and that's an encouragement to me um, because my name is not Nehemiah. My name is Daniel, uh, Daniel Joseph. And Daniel and Joseph were in, they were in, they were in separate prisons at, at certain times. But we can have uh, assurance that the Lord will comfort us in all of our trials, no matter what. Um, the book of Nehemiah was written about 14 years after the return of Ezra to Jerusalem. Uh, Nehemiah, he led up a company and restored the walls uh, and, the civil, and the civil authority during that time. Uh, of those events, um, this book in Nehemiah is the record. Uh, it's split up into eight separate divisions. Um, if you're studying this on your own, you're going to see uh, there's a journey to Jerusalem. There's the building of the wall, the consensus. There's a revival that happens here in the text. The consensus then of the priests and the Levites is written down uh, for our understanding and, uh, and, uh, and for further chron uh, chronology. There's a dedication of the wall. There's a restoration of the temple worship. Uh, and then there's the legal order restored. Um, and again, this is, the, this is the principle of what 2 Timothy 2 is talking about. And we'll see that here in just a minute. However, Nehemiah, if you didn't know, is a type of Christ. Because what Nehemiah does, and I didn't notice until I studied the text, but Nehemiah leaves his position of authority and great uh, power and recognition where he was the king's cupbearer, Artaxerxes of Persia's cupbearer, and he leaves that place of safety and of recognition, authority, and power to go be with the plight of his people. And that, to me, spoke so heavily because that's what Jesus did for us when he left his home in heaven as the, as the perfect God, as the perfect Savior to all mankind to come and die on a cross, a sinner's death, to just, just to save sinful me, just to save all of you that are saved. And, and that's the encouragement that we can have in, in reading this and seeing that marred right up against uh, what Paul's talking about in Timothy and what Jesus came and died for. So follow with me, if you will, in chapter one, uh, chapter one, verse one. And we're going to walk through. Maybe maybe we'll speed a little bit. I'll try to hasten this. And I want you to take five points down, five, five things that the goodness of God leads us to. If you're taking notes. There'll be five specific points that we uncover here in Nehemiah. And in chapter one, it says the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month Chislau in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there are in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And let me just add a word on fasting before we go into Nehemiah's prayer. If you read any other version other than the King James Version, a lot of them take out fasting. 
I just had to mention that. But there are certain things that God can do and use through His people if we will fast and pray. Not just pray, but fast. And fasting is abstaining from food, from food and water in the Bible. There are some religions and some people out there that will spread this false doctrine that, you know, we should just uh, do um, fasting from TV or fasting from our phone. Those things might be have, have, have certain earthly necessities for a time or whatever the case may be. Of course, we should separate ourselves from the world unto God. But true biblical fasting is abstaining from food and water for a certain amount of time and days that you that's really agreed upon between you and God. Amen. That has nothing to do with anyone else. As a matter of fact, God says when you do it, tell no one. So in, cha- in, uh, in verse number five, Nehemiah continues on and, and here he is and he's praying unto God. And he says, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keep the covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. Here we see Nehemiah is acknowledging even he himself has sinned against God. And he, and, he, and he pleads with God to forgive their sin on behalf of his people. And in number seven, it says, We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept thy commandments, nor thy statutes, nor thy judgments, which thou commandest thy servants, Moses. Remember, I beseech thee. Uh, The word that thou commandest thy servant Moses saying, if ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, thou there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven. Yet will I gather them from hence and will I bring and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now those now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So principle number one, we see that the goodness of God leaded, he lead, he leaded Nehemiah, to obedience. He leaded Nehemiah to obedience. That is what the goodness of God leads us to. It's the first principle that we're going to see here tonight. If you go over to the next page in, uh, in chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, And if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And that the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to then send me. Praise God that this pagan king, Artaxerxes of Persia, allowed Nehemiah, the man of God, to be sent back to go and and see and see this wreckage. And I set him a time. Move down to verse number eight. In the last sentence in verse number eight says, And the king then granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. The good hand of my God upon me. Praise the Lord for the good hand of God on us. In verse 10, chapter two, says, When Sambalot, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Now let's unpack this real quick, because that was a lot. <laughs> Tobiah, that word Tobiah means the Lord is good. That is the entire irony of my study and what, and what God showed me. I was looking for the goodness of God, and in the goodness of God, I found a man named the Lord is good, but he was not good. And we might encounter people like that. I encountered that on Friday. You know, I was just sharing with Pastor. We, 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 had, we had a Marine get in trouble, alcohol-related incident. 
And and the CO says it wasn't the alcohol. It was it was him it was him breaking the law. Okay, I mean there's some crazy things out there that people think and that people believe and it's because they do not know God and they do not know his word that they will say these vain babblings and they will speak these 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 foolish things into existence that should not be said. And it and it leads men astray. God forbid. We should not speak anything. God says that anyone that leaded one of these children into sin or disobedience should have a millstone wrapped around their necks and thrown in the deep if you look at it in Matthew and in Luke. That's what God says about people that encourage others into sin or that allow a place for sin. We should not be known as that, especially not us as Christians ever should it never be said. But Tobiah, the word Tobiah, his name literally meant that the Lord was good. Now, if you see there in verse 10, he was, he was a servant. Uh, we think that he was a servant of, of Artaxerxes as well at the time in Persia. But he was not a Jew. He was an Ammonite. And if you study out the Ammonites in God's word, the Ammonites came from the incest of Lot and his daughters. When they got him drunk... After Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed in Genesis, I believe Genesis 13. And then you have the Moabites and the Ammonites. And this is not a good thing. And then furthermore, throughout the entire word of God, the Ammonites just create problems for Israel and for the Jews and for God's people, the Hebrews. And um, after the flood, um, not after the flood, uh, after Moses... Um, led the children of Israel out of the promised land. In Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 23, the Ammonites gave no place uh, for the Israelites in the wilderness. And then uh, King Solomon, after God had already commanded not to marry foreign women, uh, he then goes and marries an Ammonite. And then they raise up, Solomon then starts raising up altars to Molech. Like, why is God's man, God's king, one of the greatest in many books that are written in here for that? Why is he doing these things that God said not to? It's because he got distracted uh, and he and he did not. He, he obviously he didn't care about the word of God at the time. He didn't know the word of God anymore. The word of God had then maybe possibly in a way, you know, left his mind, escaped his mind. He he did not realize what he was doing. Uh, and then in Amos 1.13, it says that the Ammonites uh, sought the, the pregnant women and would, would slice them open on the way. Wherever they could find pregnant women, they would slice them open. Why were they doing this to women of all people, pregnant women? That's just the, the worst thing that I could ever possibly think of, that the Ammonites would do this. But they were trying to enlarge their border. They were trying to remove their enemy uh, because the Ammonites were upset at God because... Uh, because God had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, and the Ammonites, uh, they, they basically lived in, in modern-day Jordan. Uh, they are now known as uh, Arabs or Muslims, um, but they still exist to this day. Um, but that was Tobiah. Um, and so we see that Nehemiah is brushed up against Tobiah and, and Sambalot and, and the Ammonites when he's trying to do this work for God. And what I'm trying to say here tonight is that we're going to try to do works for God. We all have a witness and a testimony where we work. The Rally Point Ministry, the Kintai Kids, this church right here, what pastor's trying to do, there will be opposition. We don't want opposition. We want the Lord to deliver us. And he surely can do that. It could be in the salvation of a family member's life. There may be opposition, but we have to maintain patience. We have to maintain trust in God. And we have to lean on him at the end of the day. And that's what Nehemiah did. So move over in, uh, move over to verse number 18 in chapter 2. And Nehemiah said, um, Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands, for this good work. But when Sambalot, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arabian, heard it, they laughed at us and scorned us and despised us and said, What is this thing that, that ye do? 
Will you rebel against God? And then I answered them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Move over to chapter 4. I told you we're going to walk through this quickly. And in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, But it came to pass that Sambalot heard that, the builded, that we builded the wall, and he was wroth, and took great indignation, and mocked the Jews. Verse number 3, Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which thy build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone. And then in verse 4, Nehemiah then answers with prayer and says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity and cover not their iniquity, God, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. But it came to pass that when, here we go again, Sambalot and Tobiah, the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites, heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped. Then they were again very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer then again unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. This is 24-7 duty right here. For those Marines and sailors in here, that's your, uh, that's your duty. SDO, duty NCO. They said, nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night. And in verse 20 of chapter 4, it says, In what place, therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. And a lot of Nehemiah is a lot of going back and forth between uh, him. Uh, uh, basically, he's putting swords in the, in, the builders, in the builder's hands. He's putting uh, instruments in the builder's hands to do the work of God, to build the wall. To, he, they're doing, they're, think about it. They're building the wall of Jerusalem. The wall of Jerusalem, if you know, praise the Lord, I was there. Um, I, I was stationed in Israel in 2011. I got to see uh, what Jerusalem looks like. Um, and it's just, it's just a... a it's, it's like a miracle. It's like, I mean, the walls, the fact that they're that old um, and they're that big, they were, it was two and a half miles long. This is the wall of Jerusalem. It's two and a half miles long. It is 40 feet high with like pure stone and it's eight feet deep. So like imagine from here to there is how deep it is. And then probably from here, from here to the back of there, plus maybe two more lengths is how tall the wall of Israel was, uh, the wall of Jerusalem. And that's what Nehemiah was trying to go back and build because it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. But we know why it was destroyed. It was because uh, Israel left God. And so God, God did promise that he would destroy it if they did not uh, obey him. Um, and in chapter 5, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read chapter 5, but give a brief synopsis. The people get upset. The people that he was with get upset. And um, they... They were like, they were like uh, anguishing because uh, they wanted food and they wanted money and they wanted a place to live. And they were, uh, they were, they were back and forth between, um, you know, should we, should we really listen to Nehemiah and do what he says? Are we really going to get this city back? Like what happens now? We have Tobiah, Sambalot, and Geshem against us. These are the, these are the, the Persian people, the Ammonites. These are, these are wicked men of God that didn't want to see God reign. They didn't want that. Um. But what Nehemiah does is he rebukes the people and they get right. Praise the Lord. Um, and in verse number 14, um, we see that uh, at that time, Nehemiah then was appointed as the governor of the land of Judah <clears throat> in chapter 5. And move over to um, chapter 5, verses 19. And it says, Nehemiah says, think upon me, my, uh, my God, for good according to all that I have done for this people. So we know the wall is not built and Nehemiah is, uh, <clears throat> Nehemiah is, uh, is still proclaiming that God is good. And he knows that uh, that work is going to pass. Um, <clears throat> and in uh, chapter 6, verse number 15, we see that it says, So the wall was finished in the 25th day of the month, Elul, in 52 days. So in 52 days, the wall was built. The wall was finished. And um, <clears throat> there were 34 towers. There were between 8 and 12 gates that had to be built. Um, and then Nehemiah says in verse 16, 
at the at the last part it says for they perceive that this work was wrought of god moreover in these days the nobles of judah sent many letters unto tobiah and the letters of tobiah came unto them and tobiah sent letters to me uh, to put me in fear verses uh, 17 and 19 say um I want to make the second point here in chapter 8. If you go over to chapter 8, and I'll be quick. We just have a few more points to make, and I'll be done. Nehemiah chapter 8. This is where Nehemiah reads the law. And Pastor mentioned this verse ironically this morning. Uh, Him and I, we didn't even talk about this. But in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, it says, So they read in the book, in the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And this is where we understand how to exposit preaching, how, how we do exegesis and eisegesis, as Brother Scott was mentioning this morning. We're not just out here just speaking out of the Holy Ghost, and we're just like pretending we're going to make up some sermon or something like that. No, there is, there is we, we read it, we understand it, then they give the sense of what was meant at the time, and then what was meant for us today, for our learning and our admonition today, as Paul says in the New Testament. So here we see that the goodness of God leads to sanctification. The goodness of God leads to obedience, and the goodness of God leads to sanctification. Surely, if they were reading out of the book of the law of God distinctly, they would be sanctified. Surely. In the next point, if you turn over to chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 1 says, Now in the twenty. And fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord, their God, one fourth part of the day and another fourth part. They confessed and worshiped the Lord God. The third principle is that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. Can you imagine if we sat here for a fourth part, for, for, for one fourth of the day and just read out of, we're talking the Torah, talking Genesis to, uh, to Deuteronomy, and we just read that. And then they, then they preached on it and they gave the sense. But then what I saw this morning was, was fire down from heaven. And, and I know that there are people that were praying that God would help them in their life. In whatever way, shape, or form, whether it's to repent, whether it's to get right, whether it's to enable, whether it's to help, whether it's to strengthen, whether it's to encourage, God was moving in their lives. And so we see that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. And um, move over to uh, verse number 28 of chapter 9. And it says, but after they had rest, they did evil again. So the principle here is stay busy for God. Don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. Stay busy. I encourage you. We're all here trying to do a good work for the Lord. Let's stay busy. Let's, there's going to be wicked people at our work. N- n- none of them, like one person came, you know, that I, I've, I've got 30 people that, I, that, that work for me. One person comes, you know, and all those people at work, they might, they might hear it at work. Encourage them what, what, where, wherever you're at, but stay busy. Don't, don't corral with the world. Don't get off of that train. COVID got us messed up. It did. It got a lot of people messed up. It got them out of church, and then now they're on YouTube and Facebook church, and that's the only church that they go to. They're not back in church. So it got them off the rails. So if you know somebody, bring them back into the Lord's house. Bring them. You know somebody that's wayward, somebody that's backslidden, somebody that needs the Lord. Bring them, bring them so they can get right. So God can get glory. And in verse 30, 33, it says, How be it thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for thou hast done right, but we have done wicked. So then they admit their sin a little bit down uh, later, and they get right with the Lord. Um, move over to chapter 12, and we're almost done. Two last points. Chapter 12 is where they uh, give thanksgiving and they dedicate the wall. And in chapter 12, verses 27, it says, And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites out of all their places to bring them to Jerusalem, to keep the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and with singing, with cymbals, psalteries, and with harps. 
And in verse 43, if you just go a little bit over in chapter 12, it says, Also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The wives also and the children rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard even afar off. Here's the fourth principle. God, the goodness of God leadeth to rejoicing. And I'll read these last two passages and we're done. In chapter 13 and verse 1, it says, On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people. And therein was found written, The Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Praise the Lord. Now it came to pass when they heard the law that they separated from Israel and all the mixed multitude. And then there was a cleansing of the temple. And before this, Eliashib, the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of God, was allied unto Tobiah. My God, my God, look what he did. Eliashib, the priest of God, having oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah the Ammonite. And then it says, But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem, for in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes king of Babylon came I unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. And, I came, and then I came to Jerusalem and understood for the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore, therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Finally, Tobiah and the Ammonites, they were exiled. They were cast out. He finally got rid of the evil and the wickedness that was in that land. This man, Tobiah, whose name was the Lord is good, was trying to destroy the work of God all these 11 years and all these 52 days that they were building the wall. Finally, they exiled them and they got rid of them. And that's what we need to do as Christians. We need to exile, delete, get rid of, remove any sin that's in our life at any time. And we need to encourage others to do the same. Same way when the CEO asks me, what is your recommendation? Indefinite alcohol ban. That has to be on the Marine. The problem is the sin. And that can only be one way, but the Marine has to get right with God first before he can not do that sin anymore and see how great of a, a shame that he's brought. And finally, uh, the last thing that we're going to see is uh, chapter 13, verses 31. This is the last verse. Nehemiah 13 verses 31 says, And for the wood offering at times appointed, and for the first fruits, remember me, O my God, for good. And the final principle is that the goodness of God leadeth us to salvation. And Nehemiah surely received salvation for this. He pleaded with God. He knew God. He walked with God all his days of his life. He saw the plight of his people. He left his perfect post his high authority with power in the kingdom of Artaxerxes in Persia, the greatest, uh, the, the greatest empire at the time of the world. You know, he left to become humble and to become meek and to go help rebuild Jerusalem. And some of those walls are still even found there today. They've discovered uh, the, the literal walls that Nehemiah built at that time. Um, but the goodness of God leadeth to obedience, sanctification, rejoicing, repentance, and salvation. Pastor.